TV producer, media coach, best-selling author, and your next person to help you with your launch. I can't wait to bring up Aurora Winter. We're going to be talking about how to get media exposure, have you become the thought leader, and how it's going to increase the profits for your business. I'm going to bring her up right after we thank our sponsor. Every business needs a book, including yours. Visit freebusinessbookpublishingcourse.com today to learn the seven steps to publish and promote your nonfiction lead and profit generating business book in eight weeks. Once again, that's freebusinessbookpublishingcourse.com. Here she is, ladies and gentlemen, Aurora Winter. Aurora, how are you feeling today? Awesome. So great to be on the show with you, Mario. Oh, it's my pleasure. You are just a wealth of knowledge and a lot of fun, I got to say. And I just want to dive right in with asking you about the media exposure because there's so few people talking about it. And also, I think there's so few business owners and entrepreneurs who realize the importance of it. Would you say that's fair to say? Absolutely true. I think most business owners spend almost all of their time managing their team, hiring new people, you know, perfecting their products and services, deciding where they're going to put their next office, but they spend almost no time communicating and perfecting their message. And when you get really good at communicating, then it's time to get on podcasts such as yours, Mario, or TV or radio or speak on stages. And that way you can communicate one to many instead of one to one. And of course, a book can be part of that, but anything that you can do once and then have, you know, tens or hundreds or thousands or millions of people watch it, that's a great way to leverage your time. So if someone wants to get the media exposure, but they don't, they, there's different personality types and some people aren't comfortable on camera. They don't really want to be doing it, but they do it because they realize the importance is more of a business thing. Other people, they're like, oh, look, a camera, I can jump in front of it. <laughs> and I think there's pros and cons to both of those. For someone who's listening going, I don't really care. I don't really want to do it, but I understand the importance. What would you say is a frequency to get enough momentum that it's beneficial to them because is one time enough? One time being on TV or? Yes. You know, I think that it's um, not quite accurate to think of the final product as that one TV appearance. Instead, I would rather invite people to think of you're communicating all day long, just like you know how to walk you're communicating, you're walking. But just like, you know, the difference between just shooting from the hip is like having a bath in your bathtub in your home versus if you're writing a book or you're going on TV, that's like swimming the English channel. You got to practice if you want to be really great. And yet once you have practiced, once you've swum the English channel, you've written your book, you've appeared on TV or you've been on Mario's excellent podcast, then your, your body goes, I've got this. And then the next time that you're speaking to an important client or you're raising capital, you're so much more clear and persuasive. The other thing I think most people don't understand is that there's recipes to communicating. And that's part of what I teach my clients and the media coaching part of my training is once you understand the framework or the recipe underneath it, you go, oh, I got this. I can, you know, sort of wing what I put in each of these parts, but like, like a blueprint for a house. It's gonna be solid because it's got a foundation, it's got four walls, it's got a roof. So once you learn these various recipes, you can communicate much more, much more effectively. And I could give one quick example if you'd like, Mario. I very much would. I was gonna ask you, so can you give us one or two of the recipes? Yeah, so here is a really simple recipe. I call it a myth bust. And once you know this recipe, you'll be hearing people do it all of the time. So for beginners, it's totally fine to say the myth is, and then the fact is, for example, here's an example. So the myth is that the best way to make a million dollars with your book is by selling a million copies of your book. The fact is the worst way to make a million dollars with your book is to sell a million copies of your book. So you know, you want to take something that people believe and then show them how that is a common myth. So any business owner, usually you're always answering the same questions over and over and over again. What if instead of getting bored and answering 
off the top of your head that you decide, oh, I'm going to perfect the answer to this <laughs> because it's going to come again and again. And maybe once you perfect it, you come on Mario's podcast and you share it. And then that video you can share with all of your clients and your friends and family and YouTube. And before you know it, millions of people have watched it or you can put it in a book or whatever. So a myth bust is great because it meets the listener where they're at and then spins it on their head. Most people put way too many words in the middle. So just try the myth is, the fact is. I like that format a whole lot. When you said uh, you call it a myth bust, I thought it was just something you named as far as like there's 18 steps to the process or anything, but you're literally just reframing the structure of it. Yeah. That's powerful. It's powerful and it's fast. And as you know, Mario. And it's simplistic. Right? Anyone can do it. I mean, there's people oh, that, you know, no matter what business is that uh, someone's listening right now, you, you take those common questions, you add the myth is, the fact is. Exactly. Any business can use it and you can use it with what your most common objections are or what you wish that people knew. You know, I can give you another one that's really easy. And of course, if people want to perfect this, it's good to practice. It's good to practice on camera. It's good to practice with somebody like yourself, Mario, who's good at media or with a media coach such as myself. So the other one is called, I call it the, the heartbreak to happiness or the hell to heaven. So you, entrepreneurs solve problems at a profit. But most people don't want to talk about the problems. But what you really want to do is condense what is the hell that people are in before they work with you and what is the heaven that you take them to afterwards without going on and on and on about all the middle steps. This is where you or many people go wrong. Not you, Mario. But where many no, people... no, please, please continue because I'm thinking of things right now uh, because <laughs> when you said people don't like to talk about the problems. I was actually working on a headline for my new book and I was looking at something and it said something to the effect of talk about the without add in all the ease and access without the problems basically or without the hassle. And I'm like, without is like a negative, not abundance word. So I'm like, I don't want to use it. Right. Well, you can use this. We can even try it on for your upcoming book if you'd like. So the, the, the formula, the recipe, everything should be a recipe that way you know i'm not the only person who I can like bake recipes that. i like food <laughs> so the recipe is you talk about the hell that people are in before your help and then you talk about the heaven so one example would be you know oftentimes people ask the question what do you do well you know how entrepreneurs have problems answering the simple question what do you do well what i do is i take entrepreneurs from catch it this is the hell the uncertainty the rambling the doubtfulness the going on and on and not hitting the the nail on the head to clear confident charismatic and the result is compelling messages that have raised millions of dollars for startup and attracted you know millions of, of readers or listeners to whatever they're up to so I winged what I filled in, but you can see there is a structure. There's a structure to it. Yeah. You're not and just going, oh, well, I help people do this. And the first step is this. And you're not giving them the training for 35 minutes to explain it because it just overwhelms them. Yeah. People first need to know, what are we talking about? You know, studies show apparently we have attention span about five seconds. And that's not quite true. Like you said, you're interested in neuroscience. It's, it's like you get progressive permission so the first permission, maybe you need to just speak for, for five seconds. So if I said that little thing and uh, about, you know, the hell the people are in and the heaven I take them to, and then if the person says, you know, what's the weather like? Well, they're not interested. <laughs> but if they say, oh, I've got that problem all the time just yesterday, you know, then we have a conversation and they've basically given me permission. So maybe then I could provide two minutes of information before they speak again. Right. And then if they want more, then maybe I could provide five minutes. So you get progressive permission. So it's not that you have to see everything in five seconds, but to get started, you want to be clear that you have something to provide that the person is interested in. Yeah. And I, I think the people who just say so much, they really are passionate and they really want to help, but they lack that structure. I was yeah. one of them. I will use yeah. me as a test study because I know there's someone listening and I want to help them. And they're going, you know what? I do talk too much when I do the things. And I remember, I'll never forget this. I was on the phone with someone trying to sell them. 
And I was like, oh, let me tell you about all the great things of the thing at the time. And yada, 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 yada. And he's like, I can tell you're passionate about what you do. I was like, oh, absolutely. And I'm thinking, oh, he's interested. He wants to buy. And he's like, but you have no sales structure or sales process. I'm like, what do you mean? The sheer fact that I, was, I, I had a question that was absolutely spot on. You know, you, you only know what you know, but when you know this new stuff or, or what would you say to the person who's encountering, oh, what do you do? Uh, I have a podcast. It didn't really tell me crap. Or I help right. people publish books. Again, it's right. not super. So why don't we even try this little recipe for you if, if you're game, if you'd like to play. So the, the problem with saying, if people ask you what you do, Mario, it's fine to say I have a podcast, but it's not excellent because it doesn't go <laughs> anywhere, right? It doesn't, it's, it's just like you've put a label on yourself. It hasn't engaged me. Yeah, I'm so, a roofer. I'm a plumber. I'm a marketer. I'm a real estate agent. I'm a chiropractor, dentist. Like, I'm an author, right? Or even we could play with your current book because you said that you were working on that. So what problem do you think your book solves or what problem does your podcast solve if you'd rather talk about your podcast? Um, the book is specifically business book publishing, only business books. Okay. So I've niched it down to that. Yeah. And then what do you think, what is the problem that it solves? Helping, uh, take people, get their expertise into, uh, did I just say expert teeth? Expertise <laughs> into an actual tangible manuscript that they can turn into a book. Right. So instead of saying, you know, what do I do? I'm an author. You could say something like, I'll, I'll wing it. Well, my books uh, also generally appeals to the same thing and solves a similar problem. Um, I'll do yours first and then I'll modify because mine is uh, more about the business strategy, perhaps. So you're, you might say, you know, how entrepreneurs really uh, struggle to communicate that they're experts and that they have authority and they have value to provide. Well, one of the things that I do is that I have this book coming out. I don't know what your new book is called. And it, you would say the name of the book, and then you'd say, and what it really does is it clarifies the value of be, becoming an ep expert authority and having that expert authority effect, something like that. And then the person can say, oh, I wanna have expert authority. You know, and where's, where do I get your book? And then you can say, well, you get my book on Amazon and you can also tune into my podcast called The Expert Authority Effect and you can learn even more, right? So that's something like that. You want to wing it? You get live media coaching and putting you on the hot spot. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, that's, that's a lot more descriptive than just leaving it as I do this or that. Yeah. Yeah. And so this book, I think, could be a companion to your book. I go. Thought Leader I mean, Launch. Love says, that. I was checking yeah, it out beforehand. Watch seven ways to make seven figures with your math, with your uh, million dollar message. It would be a good companion for your book because it really made my heart so sad that people would never finish their books. Or if they did, they put like years of work into their book and then they would press the, you know, publish on Amazon and then nothing would happen. Crickets because they didn't think through their business strategy. You know, I'm an entrepreneur at heart and I love helping people with their messages. And so I wrote this book to show people, hey, you know what? There's seven ways, proven models that you can make a million dollars with your book. Number eight. And you're, and you're so good at it. <laughs> well, thank because you. That's the, that's the thing. I've even joked about it before myself. I, and I've, I've actually turned people down because not everyone qualifies for, for my program. And I'm like, if you just want to publish a book, it's a dime a dozen. Just go type something up and put it on Amazon. 24 pages or more, upload it. It's like attaching an attachment to an email. That's yeah. basically publishing it nowadays. But I go, if you're serious and committed to marketing it, launching it, you know, all that. And to your point, the message, anyone can throw it on Amazon. I mean, it's not yeah. rocket science. We Everyone knows that. But no one takes into account the launch part of it the what are you what is your goal with it so let's talk about it and how it relates to your book you're saying seven figures with your message i have a feeling you're not going to say okay i'm going to teach you to sell a million copies of your book to your point <laughs> of the myth versus the fact well i'll say something about about 
making a million dollars with your book. So David Goggins, who is a, an ultra marathoner and uh, a former Navy SEAL, mm -hmm. he said the worst advice that he ever got was from a New York agent who told him if he self-published his book, he would sell at most 5,000 copies. So he didn't want to give away control of his life story. So he did self-publish. And in the end, he sold over a million copies of his book, plus 600 some odd thousand copies of his audiobook within less than a year. So he made probably $20 million, I'm guessing, from, from that because he didn't have to give the big chunk to the uh, big mm -hmm. New York publishers. And he did it by getting on podcasts such as yours, Mari. I don't know if you interviewed him, but. Um, Not yet, but I'd I like to. If he yeah. hears this or someone knows him, he he's more than welcome. Okay, David Goggins, come on, uh, talk to Mario. Um, so it is possible, but it's far more sensible to have a good business plan. And so there's seven proven methods, and I give stories of different experts of how they've made, you know, seven figures with their books and using them as lead magnets to attract clients, to attract your premium client, to TV and movie deals, back end for training. So there were multiple different ways to do it, but I like to, um, I guess I'm going to borrow a little bit from Stephen Covey, begin with the end in mind. Sure. So before you publish, before you write your book, but certainly before you publish it, have your strategy in mind. You know, how, how is this the beginning of a relationship with the reader and how can you contribute to them? beyond this book. And I only know this because I think I've made just about every mistake in the publishing industry possible. So my first book, I, I really, I was a film and television executive and I published my diary of healing after my husband died suddenly, uh, yeah, leaving me with a four-year-old son. And I thought, okay, that's my gift to other grieving, grieving people. It was called From Heartbreak to Happiness. And that's it. I'm done now with that story. I'm going to go back to uh, you know, writing and producing film and television, which I loved. But the book brought people to me. And, you know, before I knew it, I was coaching people and helping people through grief and then finally training coaches and took my life in a whole different trajectory. So I thought, hmm, this book thing, <laughs> this is a lead magnet, note to self. And, uh, you know, I learned by making all these rookie mistakes as I guess everybody makes rookie mistakes the first time that you and I are out there trying to help them uh, accelerate the learning curve. Yeah, you got to start somewhere. And uh, there's things I did in my first book, Video Marketing for Business Owners. And some people are like, why don't you fix it? You clearly can. I go, I don't want to. I'm actually using it as a time capsule to go, here's where I was. There's some specific things in there. Uh, I'm probably never going to change it because I don't want to. <laughs> Well, that's the really cool thing about books as time capsules, and they can be legacy pieces. And it's cool to look at an old video or an old photo or an old book in your case and see, oh gosh, look how far I've grown. But what I also love is that, you know, the clients that I deal with are typically experts or leaders or entrepreneurs that have a lot to say. They've learned a lot. They've taken a lot of wrong turns and have bumps and and come out, you know, bruised and scarred and wiser, you know, like Obi-Wan Kenobi. So they have stories to share. And what I love about helping people capture those stories in a book is that a book is like a time capsule, like you just said, Mario. That book could be opened by somebody, you know, a hundred years from now, a thousand miles from here. And it's like a, being transported to a coaching session with that person, even if they've passed on. It's really cool. Yeah, they, they I recommend uh, everyone do one. If you have a business, you definitely should do, uh, do a book. Yeah. And they're not that difficult. And with what you can add to them with the media coaching, I mean, that's incredible. So. For someone that wants to do a book, obviously talk to Aurora, but let's go to that next step. So now they're working with you. They get the book published. Now it's time to launch it and get some exposure. Okay. Well, that's the old program. So what I'm doing now is called Spoken Author. Okay. So most people, they put all the effort into the book. And then once the book is published or about to be published, they're like, oh yeah, I better get media coaching and get prepared. But now I'm reversing the order. Oh, <laughs> 
Yes, yes, I learned a few things. So when, firstly, I brainstorm what it, what is unique and special about this person or their business or their life experience um, and how can I contribute to them? And then what I'm doing is I'm interviewing them on podcasts like this one, but it is reverse engineered to be a standalone podcast, but also each podcast to be approximately a chapter of their book. And then we take all of those transcripts and that's the messy first draft. Then of course it has to be tidied up and stuff. But then the person has gotten comfortable talking about their story. They've gotten okay. all of this audio and video, which could also be text. And so by the time the book comes out, it's not like their first podcast. It's like, oh, they're old hats. They've been doing podcasts, video podcasts with me for like months. And, and you need, I mean, you probably only need one book to launch as a thought leader, but you need maybe at least 200 pieces of content. You need video, you need audio, you need snippets, you need stuff for Instagram, for Facebook, for LinkedIn. And so while I'm like, well, why do one thing and then do the other thing? Let's do it all at once. So we leverage the time. I like that. Yeah. So it, it's really fun. And also most people kind of go blank when they stare at a page, but it's very easy to talk to me, as you probably noticed. It is. It very much is. And I want to ask you about those 200 pieces of content. You're not talking about using an Abraham Lincoln quote or someone else and then putting it on your own page and being like, this is good stuff. You mean actually creating your own thoughts and sharing good ideas. Exactly. And I'm saying so this I mean, a little I sarcastic. Because there's, and I did this for a point where it's like, you're sharing everyone else's stuff. And I remember hearing years ago, they're like, why don't you use your own? Because I actually uh, started, I had quotes before I did my book, which made doing even the first book when I had no idea what I was doing easier. But I even have a quote I've used in numerous news articles and uh, press releases, uh, presentations, podcast, and all that. And it changes the game when it's yours versus you're just repeating someone else that everyone else had. How important would you say it is to be doing? Well, I think it's very important. I think your point is great. And when people are talking with me, it just happens naturally because they're writing their book, but they're really speaking their book aloud. I call it the spoken author method. Okay. And, okay. and so things come out because there's something alive about talking to somebody. So for example, one of my clients is Xander Sprague and he's a speaker more than an author and his upcoming book is Epic Begins with One Step Forward. And I think it was like two weeks ago, I taught him the hell to heaven thing. And, uh, and instantly he had like a download and he said, oh, you know how we are our own worst dream stealers. I'm like, well, that's quotable, right? He came up with it once I gave him the formula and there was like, and he's like, oh, that's good, right? <laughs> he noticed what he said. So, I mean, he comes up with these great one-liners, but I don't know if he would come up with them, you know, if he was sitting in front of his keyboard typing. It is It is a different medium. I, I, I can relate to that because there's, I, I do a lot of guest podcasting. Um, and if anyone wants me on their show and you hear this, I'm open. Um, but there's stuff I've said just naturally talking. And I'm like, that was good. And there's times I've even flat out said in the episode, I'm like, Jules, make a note of that. Yeah. It's like download. The other thing is like, I have done books the other way. Like this book is for a Stanford professor, okay. Pain Without Gain, Greg Hammer. It's an award-winning book. We launched it last May, May 11th. 2020 and it became number one bestseller and uh and it won the ippy award so that's very good um but what i've found is with my current clients for example michael stockham he's a, a senior lawyer at a law firm once we've structured out the book then i interview him he can deliver in an, in an hour conversation that's easy for him eight thousand words most beginning writers cannot write eight thousand words even if they typed all day long <laughs> So it's much faster. That's more. Do, how many uh, words do you aim for when publishing a book? I think with business books, fifty thousand words is sufficient. You know, I'm reading science fiction, so Brandon Sanderson's books can be three hundred thousand words or a hundred thousand wow. words. But fifty thousand is like this. Is book is about fifty thousand words. Thought leader launch. Um, 
300,000. Uh, I know. That's <laughs> like six to 10 books. Yeah. People like shorter books now. So I've seen some books even shorter than 50,000. I mean, 80,000 is more common range for fiction. Yeah. Um, or for, you know, those... oh, yeah. fiction, you can get away with doing whatever you want. You're literally creating made up stuff. So there's no limits to it. But with with business or, or just nonfiction in general, does someone want to really read in an encyclopedia? <laughs> it depends how good the writing is. With business, yeah, your writing doesn't have to be Pulitzer Prize winning, just the ideas or the contribution or expertise needs to add value. So, you know, it can, it can be more conversational. I think people, my personal preference is I like to read books that are more conversational, that are more um, easygoing, that are more authentic rather than I'm the expert and this is my textbook and here are the footnotes. You know, that's my personal preference. And I think that uh, is reflected nowadays. But the thing that most people don't understand is that it's in order to launch as a thought leader, you need the book, yes, but then you need to be comfortable talking on camera. You need to be comfortable giving a talk, you know, at the front of the room, give a TED talk or whatever the case may be. So to, to yeah, share- just like that, just, just sign up on TED and be like, yeah, I got next Thursday open, uh, give me a slot. Oh, okay, I might have to throw down the gauntlet and challenge you. I challenged one of my clients, uh, I challenged all of my clients and one of them, Diane Burton, came to a live event in California and uh, she practiced her TED talk and seven weeks later, she gave it on stage on TED. Yeah, so I was talking out loud there and I just realized that I'm like, crap. Uh oh, I'm, I'm gonna wanna hear from you when you book that TED talk. Why not? You got lots of experience talking on oh, camera. I, wa I wanna do one for sure. What would you wanna talk about? You know, there's a few things there was a, <clears throat> I was working on a talk for, after my uh, dad passed, I, I wrote a book as a tribute to him. Actually, he wrote it with me. Um, he wrote for 25 years in, in a boating magazine. He was a well-known accredited marine surveyor. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, I was working on something to, to a, a lot more personal, less businessy. Uh, but I got plenty of business I can talk about um, as well. I'd have to narrow it down to one. That sounded like a little bit of a dodge, but um, I don't think it's either or. I believe nowadays that what people really, both in. Yeah, I think pe people want humanity plus expertise. All expertise is like, I don't trust you. How do I know? And all humanity, it's like, here, here's a Kleenex. You need it. You need therapy. <laughs> but uh, a blend of humanity and expertise. People come to know, like, and trust you. Plus, you know, it's like dating. You don't have to be the right fit for everybody. But if you are a fit for this client, you want them to be a fit for the person you actually are, not the hypothetical person. Yeah, that, that's true. Yeah. It, it's one of the things um, on the list of I need help with. I don't really have a clear, concise thing. I do want to share. I do have a message. I do want to give. It's a hodgepodge, though. There's wow. a lot I could talk. If you asked me about a myriad of things, I'd have no problem talking on them. But condensing it down, I actually had to give a speech at a low, uh, presentation and it was five minutes. <clears throat> and it was five minutes. And I'll uh -huh. tell you, it was harder for me. And then there's someone else I know who's been on TV for 20 plus years. She's like, I wish they gave me three. <laughs> <sighs> I'm like, what? <laughs> Like, give me an afternoon. We're going to have some fun. I'm like, That's right. condensing I agree it down you. is is infinitely harder. And I think for most people, until you're very well versed and practiced. Right. Well, maybe we need to have another conversation offline about your upcoming TED Talk. <laughs> but the other thing it, with media coaching is once you understand these recipes, and I've already taught you two. How which many are you, there? Oh, almost an infinite supply, but <laughs> those okay. two will get you started. Um, so I didn't know if you had 15 or 32 or 48 or uh, a certain, you literally can create endless, you just, you, you need it catchy enough that it gets people's attention. Yeah. Okay. Well, 
I'd ha I'll have to count how many there are, but yes, I, I'm good at creating. You seem like you have hundreds of them at least. <laughs> yes. So, but what I wanted to say is that when people understand the, uh, the recipes, then they're, they, they're walking the tightrope of public speaking, but they have the, you know, the trampoline underneath them. And then when you get five minutes, you don't use one recipe for all five minutes. You link together the recipes. So 50, 30 seconds here, one minute here, 30 seconds there. And then you've got like, like a chain link fence. It's your talk is solid because each chain is solid, but you link it together and that way you keep attention the whole way through. Whereas most people, when you give them half an hour, they ramble for half an hour. But if you have the structure, then, you know, you will have like tight sound bites throughout. That, that makes total sense. Yeah. And then you have the joy that you can cut yourself out of that video and there'll be like a bunch of videos you can use on Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn, wherever you like to post videos, YouTube. You know, that's a great expert authority insight. And I want to make a point here for everyone listening, because there's videos I've watched of clients of just people that ask uh, for feedback. And some of them are 15, 20, 30 minutes long, or I'm sitting through the presentation in real life. If I'm speaking at an event, I always stay and learn and connect afterwards beforehand. And you can talk, like you're saying, you can talk for 30 minutes and it might be hard to get one or two good things you can use for promotional marketing purposes. <clears throat> but it's also, you can, you can have that 12 minute talk, like you're saying, and have so many good ones. There's certain episodes of my show. I have no doubt this is already going to be, it already is one of them. And it's going to be in the next batch where it's actually like five times as much editing because it's like, well, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. It's good. cool. We're now through two minutes worth. You yeah. know what I mean? And you might have an hour and that's what yeah. you want. So for anyone, make a giant freaking note of this and re-listen to this because what she's saying is incredible. Oh, thanks, Mario. Well, and it brings us back to what you had said a few minutes ago about, do I think it's worth it for one TV interview? Yes, because when, you know, I've been on TV news where the entire segment is two minutes and the host says something too, and it's a back and forth. So you have to be able to dance with the host so it doesn't just seem like you come on, go blah, 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 right? You can't ignore them. Um, and you don't know exactly what question they're going to ask you, but you want to also to segue to your key content that will add the most value to the listeners. So yes, I think that kind of training is valuable for the rest of your life. You lay down the extra mile in and you're be potentially a hundred times faster. <laughs> and Every I wanted person. to bring that up because you have a background with the neuroscience side of this as well. And I learned something right when we were getting started for anyone who doesn't know what myelin is, and I'm no longer part of that group as of, you know, <laughs> today, what is myelin and why is it important? Oh, I love neuroscience. Yeah. I, I took a specialty in neuroscience when I got my MBA in 2015. So Myelin is the is like around a copper wire. It's the the rubber sheath around it. So it's actually in your brain. Myelin wraps around the neurons that the synapses pass on. So in order for your uh, to have quick reflexes or quick responses, you can have more myelin. And you only lay down more myelin when you are practicing at the edge of your capacity. So if you're just phoning it in or you're totally in your comfort zone or you're in that bathtub in your own house in the warm water, you're not putting down any myelin. But the good news about myelin is you can lay it down at any age. And so media coaching lays down a whole bunch of myelin around communication that, that is like, like the bark on a tree, like it stays there. I mean, the more you use it, the more that you'll get. So you don't want to, you know, completely ignore it. <laughs> but, but it's very fascinating that my, um, the synapses can trundle along at just two miles an hour. But with practice and laying down more myelin, you can increase speeds by 100 fold. So it could go 200 miles an hour instead. And myelin uh, relates to all of our skills, whether you're playing basketball or playing tennis or running or speaking or thinking or creating. So the more you do something at the edge of your skill, which is where a great coach or mentor can help push you so that you're not you know, phoning it in, <laughs> the more you can improve at any age. Is that why the more you know, the easier it is to learn? 
Yeah, I think that's about right. That's a good quotable quote. Cut that segment out. <laughs> you hear that, Stephen Nick? Uh, so the other thing I want to ask is, can you go past the 200 miles an hour? Like if you keep doing it, can you just, is there ever a physical, you can't take it past this? Or is it just the more you do, the more you're going to get infinitely fast at it? I love how you think. Well, you, I'm, I'm sure there is some upper limit, um, but you can get 2000 miles an hour. So from two miles an hour to 2000 miles an hour. But I usually don't say that because it's such a big jump. People don't believe me, but it's true. So once you get to the 200 miles an hour, you're not done. You can get faster. Oh, I like that a whole lot. <laughs> so now you got me excited about freaking myself out recently because it's not fun. I like the warm bath water, I like being comfortable and it's easy and effortless, but you don't grow that way. Um, but it's not always fun to freak yourself out, but that's how you break through the barriers and how we got talking on this and everything. But I can totally relate to that because when you're, we were talking about the setup for the show, what's one of the reasons I designed the machine to do, I never wanted to be, I never wanted it to be a bottleneck and the specific drives, like when we did the test record in the promo, that's now at the beginning of the episode, when we did that, that thing can go. 3,500 to 6,500 megs a second, mm. basically three and a half to six and a half gigs. SS, it's a NVMe drive, a SSD, which a lot of people are common with. They think those are the fastest and they're not. It's actually 10 times faster than that. And those are two to three times faster than old fashioned hard drives. Wow. Well, look at how you show up in the world. Like my sense, my experience of you already, Mario, is you're always looking, what can I optimize? What can I optimize? How can I do this a bit better? How can I do that a bit better? How can I get equipment to support me? How can I get the right color tie to go with the, you know, interviewing Aurora and you chose exactly right. I love teal, you know, like you, but if you add up each of those 1% or 5% improvements, like then you end up with a show like you've got, I mean, amazing, right? I'm sure you didn't start that way. So I am um, really a stand for people to know that no matter what your age, you can grow, you can contribute, you can make a bigger difference. And if you want to put ice in your bath water, like Wim Hof, you could start there and then you could be climbing Mount Everest. Like, I don't know if you heard about the Iceman Wim Hof, mm -hmm. who, who's climbed Mount, Mount Everest. So our minds and bodies are capable of so much uh, if we challenge ourselves. And I think the best way to challenge ourselves is to get out of our own way and not to be thinking about ourselves at all, paradoxically. So before we started recording this show today, Mario, I just, you know, I looked over my notes, my content that I could potentially share. And then I just asked myself, you know, how can I serve? How can I contribute to, to Mario? How can I contribute, you know, to the listeners of this podcast and help them with the expert authority effect? And so that's a, a stress-free place to come from. And, and yet I'm still trying to do my best, right, to contribute the most that I can. So that's another little tip. Well, Think I do appreciate it. You're doing a fantastic job. I, I can already tell this is going to be one of the, the, I almost said that out loud. I'm really enjoying this episode a whole lot, and I'm very thankful. And I appreciate the kind things you were saying because, short answer, no, I did not start this way, but... If you start with the end of mine, like you were talking about Stephen Covey, I had a vision and I was, again, just like the myelin, I wanted to get there as fast as I could. So uh, I had a five phase plan and I jumped from one to four in the first couple months. Awesome. So did I start that way? I don't know. This seems like semantics in my mind. I was already there without a doubt. The rest, uh, the had to manifest and catch up and you know people are seeing it but yeah. i always knew where i wanted to go with it and what the mission was and who i wanted to help and it's to exponentially elevate the identity of humanity and i knew i wasn't going to do that looking like i'm talking in a closet with a broomstick or whatever if that's where you're at good start but move ahead fast i see you're exactly what i'm talking about you had a vision of the end in mind of excellence and you were coming from a place of service so stand back world you've only just seen the beginning of what Mari's up to yeah the world needs help and i'm 
the world needs a lot of help and I'm glad there's more great people out there like you that are making a difference. And I want to ask you, what made you get into this? Hmm. Well, I was just going to say, and they're going to be really enjoying your TED talk. <laughs> Um, I've always been a writer. So my story is that when I was uh, nine years old, I was in the school library and I'm so excited to read C.S. Lewis's series of books, the Narnia series, you know, it starts the lion, the witch and the wardrobe. And I remember being on my tippy toes and reaching up, you know, to get the last book in the Narnia series. And when my fingers touched the spine of the book, I felt this thrill of both anticipatory excitement and anticipatory grief because it was the last book in the series. And in that moment, I vowed to do everything I could to become as great a writer as C.S. Lewis or whatever capacity I might have because I, I couldn't think of anything more magical than just like black dots on a white piece of paper, being able to transport somebody to a magical place, another place in time where you know the characters were real to me. And uh, so it's all C.S. Lewis's fault. <laughs> great writer, great book series, and uh, that's a profound impact. Yeah, and I feel like C.S. Lewis mentored me, even though he had already passed on before I read his books, and that's the power of books. Absolutely. And now I love helping others, you know, uh, to write their books and, and leave their legacy and create a bigger impact. It's just fun for me what i love to do <laughs> it is fun isn't it and yeah to that point with the time capsule earlier i was referring my first book is a time capsule really for me to change it and also be an example for someone who's like you know here's where you can start i had to start somewhere you all start somewhere but at the same point all books are time capsules because no matter when you do it i mean it, I, it's surreal to think it's almost 10 years and yeah. it's still giving leverage it's still getting royalties it's still selling it's still helping people i'm like this is awesome why couldn't well, we learn this in school instead of here's how you re read yeah. 58 million books it's like why not learn how to contribute instead of just take 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 and you know take order not only take from the system but take order books are fantastic <laughs> are fantastic. Well, I like to tell authors that books are never done. They just stop in interesting places. Ooh, I, tell me more about this because... Well, I love the fact that with print-on-demand publishing, you know, if you find a typo or you want to add another paragraph, you can just upload an, another PDF and instantly, you know, it's it's done. It's very difficult for perfectionists such as moi <laughs> to finish a book. So I need to tell myself, okay, it's not done, but it's done for now. And it's stopping in an interesting place. So for example, my book that's coming out in, um, in May 2021, Turn Words into Wealth is the title of that book, Blueprint for Your Business Brand and Book. Um, I talk about some of my clients. So this book, for example, Where's My Joey? is um, It came out in January of 2021. And it's an award winning book. But she just won another award yesterday. So like, you know, I can add that That's or awesome. my clients go on and they, they raise more capital and then I want to add that. So it's like, you can always update a book, but I just have to get over myself and go, okay, I think my, my interior layout designer is going to kill me if I make any more changes because <laughs> it's coming out right around the corner. So I, I can relate to that. I got a personal <laughs> question for you just between us, no, uh -huh. no, no one else. <laughs> Is it easier to do, help the clients than it is yourself sometimes? Oh, I'm my own worst client. Yes, exactly. <laughs> High five on that. <laughs> yeah. I love helping my clients because I see such greatness in them, which seems to be invisible to them or hidden to them. And then when I see it, you know, I can help them shine it forth. And they're like, oh, I didn't even know I was so cool. <laughs> and they step into that. Whereas with myself, I'm just like, really, Aurora? You're still changing that book? It's coming out in a month. Get it? Stop. Stop. <laughs> You know what, what, do you, what do you find with yourself? You have to realize you want the best and you want people to experience the best. Yeah. I mean, you saw what I did right before I said, we're going to go live. And I'm like, really, who's going to see this? 
and I have to thank Pixar for it because I remember my background's in animation, 3D, special effects, broadcast, video. Mm -hmm. It might show through a little bit, but <laughs> I yep. remember reading an article, and I think it was Monsters, Inc. years ago. Um, and it was showing the frame that they used for the cave scene and how they did it in 3D and all kinds of different things. And in short... If you can visualize a cave, there was no back to it. They were filming from different shots, but the thing, 3D models, they're the coolest thing in the world because you can create anything, but you don't need the whole scene. You don't need a whole city if you're in a coffee shop and that's all you're shooting. You can literally, it's so one of the things that always drew me into video and film was, as well as you know, you can fake a whole lot of stuff. You can have someone running in the background. There is even something I did on Facebook years ago. I was waiting for a friend at lunch, framed up the camera, got the subject lit, which was me. And I was standing at a flower shop and all these vines were around me. I was like, well, Hawaii is so nice and I'm thankful I'm here. And then a truck drives by and honks. And I'm like, just kidding. You can make <laughs> anything happen out of anything. But Pixar said... And I got to find this article. It's, it's, it's in my mind. So thank you, Mylan. But it said, we, all, uh, we sand the underside of the desk. Oh, and I was I... like, what makes Pixar Pixar? Because again, same to, to publishing. There's a lot of people who publish books, but they don't do it your way. Mm. Okay. What makes Pixar Pixar? There's a lot of people who do animation. There's yeah. people who do it well, and there's people who don't, and then there's Pixar in a league of their own. And I go, they, and it, they were talking about one of the scenes they, it was something like the hair on the floor after the CDC comes. It was some minute detail. Again, yeah. no one would notice. And you know what? They wouldn't. And it said, but I would. So see, that's right great. now yeah. in this moment, I was like, no one's going to see it. No one's going to care. Maybe I should relax a little bit more. And I'm like, I just couldn't. It's not me anymore. I can't not do the best. And same thing with clients and the guest. And it's why I'm glad you're here because there's a whole lot of people waiting to get on the show, but I really only want to bring the best for Expert Authority World. So I thank you for being one of those people who uh, has the same mindset, kindred spirit values, a whole slew of other words. Mario, you are the person who stands under the desk, just like... Pixar. You want it to be perfect. And you know that it's a little bit rough under the desk. And even though nobody else would see, you take action. So you are like Pixar. And by the way, that's a very good soundbite. Anytime you can condense, you know, a point to something visual and Thank tactile. Thank you very much. That means, means a lot. Because yeah. sometimes I question, I'm like, why am I doing all, taking all this time, extra time, energy, and money to do something that, like I was saying with the thing, no one notices but me and maybe a, some of the team, but I don't even think because they're focused on other stuff too. It's like we all have our things, but it never let it stop you. Never let it stop you from moving forward or, you know, having the high standard of excellence is great. But if your book never gets out. Yeah, exactly. Writing well, most... it for five years, <laughs> I, I would never advise but don't do it sloppy either. Right. Well, one of my clients, Dr. Jennifer Herrera is her name. She's the founder of four charter schools in Arizona, Tucson International Academy. And she is so amazing. Her um, students are, are um, primarily from families that haven't gone to university before, uh, uh, largely, you know, Hispanic community and, and other people in the, the community. And she has a hundred percent success ratio getting these kids into college, a hundred percent success ratio. And these are kids who are, it's the, they're the first ones in their family to go to college. So this is pretty huge. So she had been working for five years on her book because she wanted to share this message with others because there's ways to get funding for college, but you know, you don't know if it's your first time. Um, and she ended up working with me and then I recorded interviews with her over the course of a weekend in San Francisco. So that was fun. And she was like blown away. She's like, I've been working on this for five years and it's not even nowhere close to done. And in one weekend, my book is done. I can just delegate the rest of it to Aurora and her team. And that made me feel so good because even if only one parent reads it, 
and then goes, oh, I didn't even know I could do that. Da, 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 da. And now they set their kid up for success. And that um, youth goes to college and then they have over uh, the statistics show that people who are college educated earn a million dollars more over their lifetime. So if I help her help even just one person change their life, that is really good karma points. <laughs> it's totally worth yeah, it. Yeah, the ripple effect of that too. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that that's incredible. Yeah, and she has this expertise. Five years to one weekend. I think that that's a hook or a headline right there. Absolutely, you're right. Five years to one myth. It takes five years to write a book. Fact. It it takes five hours. Yeah. Well, maybe more, a little bit more than five hours of her, her, her time, but a whole bunch more time that she just not more than 48 one weekend, not more than 48. Yeah. <laughs> she wasn't up all the time. Yeah. It takes five An years hour. to myth. It takes five years to write a book. Fact. It takes less than 50 hours. Yeah. Well, it took her 10 hours at most. Well, there you go. Maybe it was only five hours if you take off lunch It would break. be interesting to see what, what it actually took. And you could say it's, it's less than watching the matrix trilogy or less time than you know what i mean how Maybe. someone else would invest it like um sure as heck less than all the marvel movies <laughs> see you're already thinking in sound bites turn it's it into sound Milan is, he's a quick study <laughs> you are a quick study mario i love it yeah you're a lot so, sharp you know uh, what was that thing like if you're saying to me you're a lot sharper than you look <laughs> i did not say that i know but it's just funny but yeah, I catch on. Like I, I love visual learning. And yeah. I've told people that. And I think it's why I, I never really enjoyed school because everything was written. But it's like if you show me or there's some visual component to it, like a, a 3D animation, there's kids throwing chairs against the computers and walking out of class. And I, I was it was just too much for them to handle. It was calming for me. When you're spinning the things in 3D space with the shadows and the ambient occlusion and the lighting and the movement and the uh, kinetic rigging and all this different stuff, I was like, oh, this is easy. Photoshop, awesome. I'm like, is there anything <laughs> else we can be doing? This is, you know what I mean? Everyone learns differently, but it's like that Einstein quote with the fish in the tree. It's like everyone's a genius, but if you expect a fish to climb a tree, you're the you're the idiot. Yeah. Paraphrasing. A, a well, you sound like majority. you've got a lot of myelin in that brain there. You know what it's what surprised me is that I have a lot of clients who are dyslexic. So writing is difficult for them. Words are difficult for them because they tend to switch the order around, but they are so smart and they, they look at the world differently. So dyslexic people have great books in them, I've discovered. Richard Branson is dyslexic and he's written no kidding. a ton of books. Yeah, he's accomplished a couple of things, one or two. Yeah. But you can be sure he's not the one at the keyboard typing. He's dictating his books to somebody else who's then, you know, going off and being the word wrangler. That's the other myth I'd like to bust. Okay, oh. I, have a myth. I have another myth to bust. The myth is that the author of the book is the person in front of the keyboard. The fact is the author of the, of the book is the person whose ideas and experience it is. Like it's a whole different skill set to be the person who's like spell checking and, you know, making the transition smooth in the paragraphs and deciding how to structure the book. And I would just love people to get over this idea that they have to be typing in order to for it to be their book. That's not true. Look at Richard Branson. I mean, almost all, I, I was going to say all, I believe the truth is all, but I'm going to say almost all <laughs> to be safe. You know, the famous politicians who write books like such as the Obamas and Hillary Clinton, et cetera, they're not typing. They're not writing. They are dictating their stories to expert ghost writers and editors and secretaries and researchers who then turn it into a book. So I just love people to get over that block to writing their book when they, they think that they have to do everything. I so appreciate you for sharing that because I've been asking people for a while. I had one of those. I flat out, I was like, maybe not so much the typing part and all of that, but for the people who are like, I want to write a book, but they don't want to write it. They just want the book. They want the book for the piece the impression I got from them, and maybe this is my own thing, I felt like they didn't have as much heart. They just wanted it for yet another marketing thing, and it's so much more personal to me than just, oh, I want to do a blog, I want to do a podcast, I want to do a thing. It was just a thing to them. 
And maybe mm. that's where this stemmed from. But I was always trying to wrap my head around the whole ghost writer versus author versus if you do it this way versus that. But you just you just summed it up real succinctly. It's the author is the person whose thoughts and experiences it is. Absolutely. There's another soundbite for you. <laughs> oh, I for, I for sure. When you were saying it, I'm like, click, click. That, but it's not perfect. liberating. It's liberating, right? And then people who don't have time to write or 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 freeze when they look at the blank page can can share their story on audio, just talking to themselves, or get you know perhaps be interviewed by you, Mario. If you I like do talk to myself, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you keep yourself well amused. Oh, and always. That's how I know if I'm uh, like if I'm not <laughs> feeling well. If I'm not sitting there rambling off something yeah. hilarious. I'm like, I probably don't feel good. I should probably lay down. It's all, you know, it's very <laughs> far and few between. But if I'm just sitting there not even smiling or saying anything, I'm like, you got to check your attitude, bro. Something's going on in there. You are hilarious. <laughs> Fully aware of that. Not afraid to admit it. I even said it to people. I'm like, if you're going to be stupid and act like this all day, I'll go talk to myself for the wall. We'll have a better conversation. And we will. Okay. One more tip, because I think this will really... It, it, interest the experts who are following your show or would be experts is that Amazon is the number three search engine. So if you have some kind of expertise and you want, important? yeah, <laughs> I'll get to that. So, if, you know, if you want to position as the expert authority, as, as Mario is teaching you and benefit from the expert authority effect, you've got to have a book on Amazon, assuming you've got some authority and some expertise. So the reason that that's important is because um, Google is the number one search engine, YouTube is the second uh, search engine, and then Amazon after that. So most people know that you know Google ads, Facebook ads, YouTube ads, like they get very expensive. But if you are on Amazon, you're only competing with other authors, and authors, generally speaking, do not spend gobs of money, like uh, big companies like Tesla would, for example, on, or marketers on Google. Or yeah, a lot of marketers don't have books, um, and and the and you can reach a global audience who are looking exactly for the solution that you provide. So you know, people can find. Uh, your upcoming book, I'm not sure what the title of your new book is going to the be. The Expert Authority Effect Publishing Method. Okay, the Expert Authority Effect Publishing Method on Amazon, or they can find my new book, you know, Turn Words to Wealth, Blueprint for Your Business Brand or Book. And there is like, the people on Amazon, they're ready to buy. People on Facebook, you know, you're interrupting them. People on Google, they may be searching for information, but they may not be ready to buy. People on YouTube, and I watch a lot of YouTube podcasts, I love podcasts, but they're looking generally for information or entertainment. It's a great way to build know, like, and trust, as you know, Mario, as you demonstrate, as you teach, but people who are on Amazon are ready to buy. And a book is such a small investment. So that's why it's really important to be on Amazon. Uh oh, I think you just froze. Can you hear me? Um, I can hear you, but your video has frozen. Fantastic. That was a great <laughs> point on the Amazon. And I'm glad you brought up the buy side of it. Mm -hmm. If I can just pause you right there for a second. I don't know what happened. This has never happened before. It usually happens before or after. Um, let's use some of that myelin. So. And then I need to leave in a, in a minute. What in the world? Why? This is going so well and she's so awesome. <laughs> oh, well, these things are sent to grow myelin, right? Absolutely. All right. Uh, so since I've done this hundreds of times, here's what I'm going to do. It's This might be one I have to... Re I'm glad you can hear me. That's fantastic. I'll take care of the video somehow um, or just put a still shot. But uh, I wish you could see the wheel of whatever. I'm going to spin it real quick and then I'm going to ask you about some books real quick. I'm spinning the wheel. There's the audio. It landed on a thing. My question for you is 
what is something that you've been pushing the limits for that you still want to achieve? That I still want to achieve? Yes. Hmm. What is something I've been pushing the limits on that I still want to achieve? I'm not sure. That's a really good question because in the wake of the pandemic, I've actually been focusing on being present and loving everything and finding that there's nothing missing. I was living in Silicon Valley, which has a very striving go, go, go energy. And I was raising capital for a company that I still think is a good idea. Um, but I've I'm sorry to have a lame answer to this question, but I'm totally... It's not a lame answer, and it's, it's an honest answer. That's all I ever yeah. ask of uh, my VIP yeah. guest is... Um... I'm done with striving, and my goal is to contribute to launching thought leaders who... I like that. Difference. I like that a whole lot. So I'm going to skip the sponsor real quick. We're going to come back for the imperfect action round, and then I'm going to ask you about a few books. And uh, so... And we're back with the imperfect action round. Aurora, are you ready to take imperfect action? I am. First question, three questions, 60 second or less answers. The first one is, what is the fastest path to the cash? Mm. Blessing, abundance as already coming your way. Excellent. Number two, what is the biggest problem you see your prospects making and the fastest way for them to fix it? The biggest problem I see them making is trying to write their own book themselves and making all the rookie mistakes and getting really frustrated. And the fastest solution is to read helpful books like Mario's or like mine, and then um, you know work with somebody who who is good at writing who can help you. Excellent. Number three, what is the best way to maximize customer lifetime value? <laughs> Add 10 times more value than you charge. So my goal is always to create a 10x ROI for all of my clients and the readers of my books so that they just are so thrilled with the value that they receive. And value is multiple things. It's not only the goods and services you provide, but how do you make people feel? Make them feel great. Make them feel like the champions that they are and help them see what's possible for them. And you will have clients who stick with you for life as, as I do. Fantastic. Um, what books would you recommend to Expert Authority World? Well, obviously they've got to read your book. I love the book, The Talent Code by Daniel Coyle. It talks about myelin. I appreciate the book Mindset by Dr. Carol Dweck, which talks about having a growth mindset, which is a big thing you can always grow. And of course, I would love for you to read one of my books, Thought Leader Launch, or Turn Words Into Wealth. Fantastic. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on the show, and I appreciate everything you've been sharing this entire time. It's really nice to connect with you, Mario, and uh, I look forward to hearing this podcast and watching your TED Talk and staying in touch. You're awesome. Well, thank you so much. All right, Expert Authority World, we have another great episode here today. I'll see you tomorrow. Have a great day, and God bless.